Welcome, everyone. Welcome. It's so wonderful to see everybody in this space. Of course, this is uh, our college hour space, 10 a.m. on Wednesdays in Butler Church, and it's so wonderful to see all of you here. Uh, my name, if I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, my name is Brian Davis. I get to serve as the campus chaplain here, and again, I just want to welcome everybody here to our college hour. Just a, a note in the beginning, um, if you're still kind of making your way in and looking for, for a seat, um, we have opened up the sides here. Feel free to use the space. There's some more uh, space on this side. 
uh, if you're still looking for a, a place to sit. Well, today uh, for College Hour, uh, you'll hear a little bit more in, in just a few minutes, but we've partnered with our seminary for the Believer's Church Lectureship Series, where we have uh, a speaker uh, has come all the way from Messiah, Messiah University now, uh, Drew Hart, but uh, we'll give a more formal introduction to him in just a few minutes. Um, but I just want to say, again, welcome. It's so wonderful to be here with you, and we just uh, felt that just to begin our time together, it would be wonderful to worship through singing together. So we have our worship leaders, um, Shalom and Adam, behind me that will lead us in worship. So why don't we go ahead and stand together? I will pray for us, and we will get started. Join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to worship you together and to hear from uh, just an amazing man. Uh, so uh, we, we start with the assumption that you are with us here in this place this morning. And we want to take the opportunity to uh, center ourselves on you, uh, on your good news. Would you meet us here this morning? I pray all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. Let's all worship together. God's goodness and his faithfulness this morning. You come at the right time when I least expect it, never behind. So I, so I, would I be surprised when you deliver every time on mountaintops? On mountain tops, you stay the same in valleys low. You never change, I believe, and I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord. I'm confident, and I'm confident. As seasons change, your faithfulness remains. Oh, sing you go before me. You go, you go before me to prepare a blessing. Made a way. It's more than I could imagine. It's more than I could imagine. More than I could fathom or comprehend. On mountain tops, you stay the same. In valleys low, you never change. I believe. And I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord. I'm confident, and I'm confident as seasons change, your faithfulness remains. Let's sing that again. I believe, and I believe. That I will see the goodness of the Lord. I'm confident, and I'm confident as seasons change, your faithfulness remains. God of our present and the God of our future. God of my present, God of my future. You write my story. You hold it. Let's sing that out together. God of my present, of my present, God of my future. You write my story. You hold it all together, God of my present, 
God of my future, you write my story, you hold it. One more time. God of my present, God of my future, you write my story, you hold it all together. And I believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord. I'm confident and I'm confident as seasons change. Your faithfulness remains, I believe, and I that I will see the goodness of the Lord. Yes, I'm confident as seasons change. Your faithfulness remains. Your faithfulness remains. Yes, Lord. God, your faithfulness remains. God, this morning we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, that carries us through every trouble and adversity, through the highs and the lows, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you see us, that you love us. God, we praise you and we love you in return, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Good morning, my name is Lynn Jost. I teach at the seminary. I'm the director of the Center for Anabaptist Studies. And I add my welcome to that of Brian. Uh, thank you college students, university students for accepting us as your guests today at College Hour. Uh, welcome as well to those who have come particularly for the Believer's Church Lectureship. We're glad to have all of us meeting together today. As we think about both the message of our speaker and about the mission of the Center for Anabaptist Studies, several words from our speaker's website are particularly helpful. He talks about radical discipleship to Jesus, which refuses to distort and domesticate Jesus' life and teachings. He talks about a Christian public witness that rejects the temptation to privatize our faith. And he talks about Christian solidarity that is Jesus-shaped and reaches out to the marginalized. That is the essence of our life as followers of Christ. So our speaker today is Dr. Drew Hart, professor at Messiah University and more than a professor. He is a, an activist. He is a person with 10 years pastoral experience. He has worked in leading anti-racism workshops, and it's our privilege to welcome Dr. Drew Hart. Thank you again for coming. Well, I hope Dr. Hart is here. Let's see. Uh, anybody know where he's gone? Well, Brian said that he would step in if necessary, so I'm glad that Brian can give the lecture. To, no, he can't either. Uh, hmm. Hannah, is he back in the quiet room? All right, he'll be in a second.
Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. I've been looking forward to this time together. Um, and this, this morning I would like to have us think about uh, the theme of radical discipleship. Radical discipleship. Um, I often say that, and I've been talking quite a bit in some of my other talks uh, the past two days about the ways that we've domesticated Jesus, the ways that we've watered down his witness, the way that we have diseased and distorted who he is, and sometimes weaponized him in ways that uphold the status quo. Um, and we've done this in a whole variety of ways. Um, in terms of, uh, to my students, I talk about the cradle to the cross jump, right, that we make. That is, uh, we love baby Jesus, right, and, we, and everyone loves talking about Jesus dying on the cross. Um, and then we kind of like conveniently uh, de-emphasize everything else in the middle, which tends to be the majority of the gospel narratives, right? And so these fancy ways that we engage uh, the person of Jesus that doesn't have us uh, reckon with the really challenging uh, life and teachings um, that invite us to follow in his way. Uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Richard Crane, he, he jokes with his students, he says that, that we treat Jesus like a crazy uncle at the family gathering, right? That is, you know, when you, you gather and you have that like one family member, imagine like you bring a guest with you to Thanksgiving and that one family member that just says like crazy off the wild things that are kind of embarrassing and you gotta like tell your friend, oh, don't worry, that's just uncle so-and-so, right? Nobody takes him seriously, right? And that, that we kind of treat Jesus in that way as well. Uh, oh, that's just Jesus. He didn't really mean, um, you know, take up your cross and follow me and, and, and give your life and lose your life um, in, in the path of radical discipleship to his way. Uh, we, we domesticate so much, even when we think about the meaning of the cross, I mean, when people, we sing about the cross and all these kind of things, but, but when it comes to actually taking Jesus seriously about taking up your cross and following him in terms of how we actually live our lives, that usually we kind of downplay and stuff. And so we've domesticated the meaning of the cross to mean just about anything that fits in with a comfortable American lifestyle, right? So, you know, if let's say you're wearing a Christian t-shirt and someone gives you a funny look, you know, you're like, well, that's my cross to bear for Jesus, right? Or maybe, you know, um, you're trying to go to the store and there's no close parking spots. And so, you know, your cross to bear for Jesus. Uh, or worst case scenario, you know, the middle of the night in the winter and your electric blanket breaks down, right? Cross to bear for Jesus. Uh, we find uh, all kinds of ways to domesticate the meaning in life of Jesus Christ. In one way or the other, we come up with fancy ways for Jesus' good news to become uh, bad news to the poor uh, and good news to the rich. Uh, we subvert God's kingdom so that the status quo is maintained and God's new creation and new society is often squelched. We vandalize the name of Jesus and try to make him out to, to be a mascot for social dominance. And yet still, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John continue to bear witness to Jesus, right? Um, that Jesus who in Luke 13, 31 and 35 says, go tell that fox right, to Herod in this radical revolutionary response, um, that Jesus uh, in Luke 4, 18, 19, who says he came to let the oppressed go free, uh, that Jesus, who's known for teaching about peacemaking and, and speaks truth to power and confronts the establishment and, and loves his enemies and embodies God's reign right on the ground. And so, what I want us to do is to look into a little bit of this life of Jesus and think about, in many ways, uh, what I'm interested in is how he might even spark our imagination for strategic activism towards God's justice and God's love in the world. So let's uh, jump and look at Mark. I'm going to read Mark 11, 1 through 24. This is what it says. It says, when they were approaching Jerusalem, at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that, was, that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it and will uh, send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street as they were untying it. Some of the bystanders said to them, 
what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread their leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Then they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were will selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He was teaching and saying, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt it in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And we already see just really quickly the, the ways in which Jesus is willing to disrupt the status quo uh, fueled with a vision of God's shalom, um, this encompassing vision of the healing and flourishing of all creation, um, pursuing uh, justice and harmony in our interconnectedness that God desires for all of us. And so what I want us to do here again is to focus on the strategic nature I want to emphasize in this case of Jesus's intervention and, and how he invites us to take up our own crosses and bear witness to God's reign here on earth as well. Mark's narrative, in, the, in Mark's narrative, the escalating conflicts with the Jer Jerusalem, uh, the Jewish and Roman establishment climax as Jesus approaches Jerusalem. Mark tells his readers that as Jesus approaches Jerusalem near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples ahead of the group into a nearby village, instructing them to find a colt that was tied up and to bring him, uh, bring to him uh, that cult so that they could enter um, into the city. Just following the story as it unfolds, we should wonder though why Jesus wants them to bring a cult. And why, as he's arriving to the center of power in Jewish life, does he seem to have this plan set in motion that needs to be executed? I want to make the case that uh, and that not just for Mark, but even some of the other gospel writers, that they're illuminating the significance of the person and ministry of Jesus precisely at times through his strategic messianic theatrics. Jesus could have simply walked into this city with his crowd of admirers, but instead Mark depicts Jesus intentionally orchestrating a plan that required some strategic preparation. And as we will see in a moment, getting a colt rather than a horse was important for the reign of God embodied in his movement. This was all socio-political theater being staged. Mark's depiction of Jesus is organized. He has come to Jerusalem as Passover is approaching, and he has a plan that he plans to execute. In Mark's telling of the good news, Jesus is a strategist carefully executing his messianic demonstration, which begins with obtaining a cult. Many Christians, I think, prefer to think of Jesus as coming to Jerusalem kind of apolitically, right? Solely to die for our sins. Uh, a few Sunday schools tell the story in such ways that Mark does, right? Unveiling Jesus as a perceptive strategist who is engineering particular responses from people through theatric public protest. Uh, nonetheless, I think that's 
quite what we find here in Mark. Jesus' strategic preparation places a challenge for the church, right? Too often the church leaves the work of strategy to Christians who sometimes allow their partisanship to overcome uh, their allegiance to God's reign. Or those with greedy motivations, those in search of more and more money or power, more influence, more fame. In the Gospel of Matthew, ironically, Jesus actually calls his followers to be wise as serpents and yet as innocent as doves. We're called to work, uh, to do the work of scheming and plotting for good, uh, for God's delivering presence on the earth, for justice, righteousness, and peace in our world. And we do this while refusing to use the evil means that the powerful employ to accomplish their goals. We remain as innocent as doves, but by employing strategies of peacemaking and nonviolence, by overcoming evil with good through radical love and prophetic intervention, and through vulnerable non cooperation with anything that clashes with the reign of the Messiah. We are invited to scheme and plot for God and to engage in strategic preparation in the way of Jesus. Uh, many people are familiar with uh, Dr. King's uh, activity in Birmingham, but few realize that, that what he calls Project C, that was their action there, was the brainchild of Wyatt C. Walker. He was a creative strategist who planned to confront the pressure points of Birmingham, uh, especially the business district in particular. We know how the story ends with children filling the streets, arrested by the masses, attacked by dogs, sprayed with water hoses that were ripping off some of their clothes. Uh, the evening news footage of these events horrified the nation and led to further civil rights legislation. But those events didn't happen randomly or coincidentally. They were the results of preparation, planning, and strategy. The goal was to dramatize the structural oppression through creative political theatrics. Often when justice on the large scale occurs, it's because people put their minds together and plans and plotted for good. Action that leads to victories like these requires intentionality. Jesus orchestrating the cult to ride on was itself central to Jesus' intentionally creative demonstration, which is why Mark takes so much time describing the disciples being instructed about obtaining this specific animal. Then we move on uh, uh, in Mark and we see uh, what I call strategic revolutionary symbolism. Mark tells us that after the disciples fa faithfully followed through with Jesus' uh, plan to secure a cult, people threw their cloaks on the animal which Jesus began to ride. Crowds began to form and spread their cloaks and branches on the road for Jesus to travel upon, responding as if he were royalty beginning a new reign. The political theatrics Jesus designed clearly evoked something deep and profound within the people who responded to him with cries of Hosanna and blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Formally, Hosanna was used to, uh, as praise, but it literally meant save us, save us. And both meanings are probably being expressed simultaneously at this moment. The people believe that God, using Jesus as their liberator, will restore the kingdom of David. They look to Jesus as their revolutionary savior, the one in whom they have placed all their hopes for deliverance from the oppression, exploitation, and degradation that they experience every day. They believe that a new age for Israel will begin in Jesus, that he will inaugurate restoration and ignite independence from their occupying oppressors. Uh, what was it, though, that sparked such a radical expectations and hopes from the crowd? What was it that Jesus did that, that initiated that? If we're to understand the response of the people, uh, we need to recognize Jesus' actions in this moment as the execution of strategic revolutionary symbolism. There are two primary images Jesus is evoking for his Jewish audience that would spark this kind of response. First, Jesus is embodying Zechariah chapter 9, 9 through 10. This is what it says. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The crowds on the road were Jews who would have understood this text and the meaning of Jesus' dramatized socio-political demonstration. 
Their response indicates that they were filled with faith that God was about to do a new thing, that the divine deliverance was unfolding before their very eyes. They believed divine intervention was about to be ignited through human faithfulness. The creator and sustainer of all things was about to take action in history through this anointed king, giving them ample reason to shout out, Hosanna, Hosanna. There's a second powerful reason for their response as well. The Jews more than a hundred years prior had successfully revolted against Syrian oppression. During that revolt, Judas and the Maccabees rode, rode triumphantly into Jerusalem in similar fashion with palm branches layered on the road before them. By the time of Jesus, the Maccabees were legendary. Because of them, the possibility that God might actually intervene in their affairs through a messianic figure was etched into the minds of the people. Jesus' choice to enter Jerusalem in this particular way was loaded with radical symbolism from both scripture and history. The crowd's response of praise and turning to Jesus for deliverance from their hardships were not coincidental. They had just experienced very strategic revolutionary symbolism. This response evoked in the hearts and minds of the people was exactly the kind of response one would expect given Jesus' particular action. Their hopes for deliverance from their oppressors and the restoration of Israel were not out of nowhere. The evoking of their liberatory hopes was part of the intended goal, I would argue, of Jesus' action. Strategic revolutionary symbolism occurs when a particular social action, political embodiment, or prophetic witness awakens people to the awareness that another social order is possible. Often empires and those with concentrated power project the impression that they will never cease and that things will always be as they are. In such conditions, the best option for survival is to merely align as best as possible with the current structural realities, with the status quo. Hope for anything else is often beyond what seems possible. We are not able to envision God's dream of a just world for us. But this kind of strategic revolutionary symbolism, this strategic uh, re symbolism broke open a subversive hope in God's Messiah and in a new age that was dawning. And so here we have Jesus riding in on a colt. As Jesus symbolically fulfilled scripture and evoked historical consciousness, the people awakened to the Messiah's reign. Despite the risks, many of them began to place their bets that divine intervention was breaking through in the very person of Jesus Christ. As Jesus rode, each branch or cloak that was laid before them represented the desires to break free from captivity to the status quo. Each praise lifted up by a member of the crowd represented the recognition that Caesar or the Jewish establishment was not Lord over their lives. Their praise and cries of salvation were directed to the only worthy recipient. Their embodied worship was a revolutionary act of awakening and of expectation. They had previously attributed to their current social order the divine attribute of eternal permanence, which would have been idolatrous. But with their awakening to Jesus as the Messiah, they could begin to imagine new possibilities of God's deliverance and for pursuing true justice and righteousness in this world. Don't miss that the two symbolic images evoked by Jesus actually clash with one another. Zechariah 9, 9 through 10 is a peacemaking liberator that ends chariots, the war horse, and the battle bow, which grounded military power, and instead he brings peace to the nations. They both bring victory and, and oppression, but the, the means are different. Here we find Jesus awakening the people through these powerful symbols of liberation, but ultimately he doesn't come on a military horse, he comes on a humble colt. This is God's deliverance, where divine power expressed through human weakness rather than military strength is on display. You know, a great example of strategic revolutionary symbolism in more recent history occurred in the salt march that Mahatma Gandhi led against the British in the early 20th century. The British Empire had taken complete control over salt in India, so they controlled the production of salt and taxed it as well. In March 1930, Gandhi and 70 companions, <coughs> they began the salt campaign, which was a 240-mile walk to the sea at Dandi. 
Gandhi and his companions stopped at town after town, announcing the campaign, rallying local villagers, and inspiring people to engage in satyagraha, a word which translates as truth force, and that uh, Gandhi used to describe the force of nonviolent resistance. Thousands and thousands of people caught the vision and joined the mass movement heading to the shore. On April 6th, the group arrived at the beach where Gandhi engaged in a very simple act. He extracted a handful of salt from the ocean, right, in his hands. This action was strategic revolutionary symbolism. When Gandhi defied the unjust laws of the British Empire by holding up the salt he had taken from the sea, his action had a liberating effect on the consciousness of the people watching. Like dominoes, Indians everywhere began disobeying British claims over salt and boiling seawater and making their own salt in defiance. While this act alone did not end British rule, it did revolutionize the mindset of many people. Freedom became a real possibility. We should never underestimate the power strategic revolutionary symbolism can have in delivering people from passive submission to the status quo uh, when enacted through a prophetic witness courageously in the public square. Let's move on, though, because we also see in Jesus what I call strategic discernment. Mark tells us that Jesus entered Jerusalem and headed straight for the temple. Those with him must have been thinking that everything was about to go down, that this was the place and time when the Messiah would liberate their homelands. Divine time had taken them to this very moment, it seemed, when the Messiah's reign would go public and be made manifest for the world to see. People's expectations were at a peak, and the crowd's anticipation was bubbling over. From the start of the Gospel of Mark until this point, listeners and readers of the story have experienced Jesus engaging in escalating conflict in preparation for this revolutionary climax of the Jesus story. Jesus versus the elite Jerusalem establishment was a, a clash that seems inevitable in the Gospel of Mark. But unlike Matthew and Luke, which portrays Jesus beginning his demonstration the moment he arrived at the temple, Mark tells us that Jesus entered the temple looked around while scouting out the situation, and then left. It's hard to imagine a more anticlimactic moment. Mark's narration tells us that rather than taking revolutionary action at the temple right away, Jesus engages in a reconnaissance mission. He takes notes on the situation and then and scouts out the situation, discerning that it was a little too late in the day to initiate what he had planned. This would have been especially puzzling for onlookers because the crowd was, they were with Jesus, ready for action. For, the, for those watching, this had to be a terribly disappointing and underwhelming end to what had begun as a seemingly revolutionary moment. However, knowing the right time to act is an important feature of Jesus' discernment, I think, even in Gospel of Mark. As mentioned earlier, in Mark, we see Jesus frequently trying to keep his identity a secret because he doesn't want to broadcast his messianic intentions for everyone quite yet. Some Christians make distinctions between chronos time and kairos time. Um, with chronos time as more chronological time and kairos time, people uh, suggest is uh, about the right season or moment for something to occur. Jesus in this narrative then could be thought of as, as strategically discerning his kairos timing. A common proverb in the black community, in the black church in particular, is, is saying that God is never on schedule, but always right on time. Those engaging in strategic discernment understand that just because everyone is hyped does not necessarily mean that it's the right time for every action. The church needs to pray and seek God to discern our kairos moment. We want to strike when the iron is hot, which must always align with God's delivering presence, right? What God is up to. We want to go with the currents of the Spirit's activity rather than against it. We also want to use wisdom. Engaging in strategic discernment involves using our minds and being conscious of factors that could thwart our ultimate goals. In this case, Jesus' decision was simple. He, would, he wouldn't have had the dramatic impact that he wanted in his demonstration had he acted impulsively. Despite the anticlimactic nature of the moment, Jesus and his disciples quickly slipped out of the city and headed back to Bethany for the night. You know, Dr. King also famously made an unpopular and anticlimactic decision during his work with the Southern Freedom Movement when he discerned that the consequences of moving forward might work against their ultimate goals. 
In 1965, Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference came to Selma, Alabama, a decision that was already problematic since much of Alabama was the territory of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC as many people say, where this younger and frequently more radical group of young people had already been engaging in grassroots organizing work for the long haul, registering people to vote and recruiting them to defy white supremacist intimidation around voting. Nonetheless, Dr. King and the SCLC came to Selma, and the nonviolent demonstrations there drew national attention very quickly because Sheriff Jim Clark and others from Selma seemed incapable of responding to black people with anything other than blunt and unveiled physical violence. In February, during a small, smaller evening march, police and troopers ambushed the crowd, shooting and killing Army veteran Jimmy Lee Jackson. Jackson's death came just five days after the assassination of Malcolm X, who had recently visited Selma as well. Movement leaders decided that Jackson's casket would be walked from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama's capital, as a symbolic act. While that symbolic action was never carried out, a march was organized shortly after the funeral. About 500 marchers arrived at Selma, Selma's Brown Chapel and began walking two by two, heading to Montgomery. When they arrived at the Edmund Pettus Bridge, they found it blocked by waves of white officers and troopers. They proceeded anyway. Then they were warned that they had two minutes to turn around. The marchers persisted and all hell broke loose. One trooper yelled, get them, get the niggers. Troopers and officers lunged at the nonviolent and unarmed marchers, setting off tear gases and cracking skulls with their billy clubs. Many marchers, finding themselves trapped and unable to make their way through the armed officers, thought they might die. Eventually, the marchers were able to escape and return to the church, while those who had been seriously hurt were taken to Good Samaritan Hospital. This repressive act of violence against those, these nonviolent black marchers would be remembered as Bloody Sunday. Thousands of people who saw the news footage of Bloody Sunday violence came to Selma to support the movement. But the movement leaders received an injunction forbidding them from holding another march. Dr. King and others felt that they needed to confront the violence with courage, especially since thousands had joined their struggle, so they proceeded anyway. Once again, when marchers arrived at Edmund Pettus Bridge, they met state troopers waiting for them. Dr. King had been out of town for the first march, but he was present and leading the march from the front this time. Seeing the troopers, he stopped, knelt down, and he prayed. When he rose to his feet, the marchers behind him were antsy. Many had, ironically, come ready to nonviolently confront the violent law and order that kept that city under its thumb. Dr. King, however, discerned that going against the court injunction, rather than waiting to get it reversed and have a legal ruling on their side, would be a short-term win, but a long-term mistake and could cripple their ultimate goals. He made the anticlimactic and very unpopular decision to turn the thousands of marchers around and head back to the church. This decision was likely the impetus for the final fracture between SCLC and SNCC, um, one that really at that point never healed after that point. As Dr. King predicted, they did get the court's approval to demonstrate. So on March 21st, 1965, for the third time, nonviolent protesters gathered to march all the way from Selma to Montgomery. This time, the crowd of marches was very large and included those who came in response to the invitations of Dr. King and others. And federal marshals and troopers escorted them instead of blocking their way. By the time the crowd reached Montgomery, after days of walking and camping, it had grown to over 25,000 people. In Montgomery, Dr. King delivered his famous speech calling out the words of the Civil War era hymn, How long? Not long. Because mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. He has sounded forth the trumpets that never call retreat. He's lifting up hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. Our God is marching on. Not only do we see that, though, we also see in Jesus what I call strategic prophetic disruption. 
Mark tells us that while Jesus is leaving Bethany and on his way back to the temple, he is hungry and he sees a fig tree in the distance. As Jesus approaches it, he discovers that the plant has produced no fruit. We're told that the reason for the lack of fruit is because it was not the season for figs. Fair enough. But then Jesus does something that to American sensibility seems odd and harsh. Yes, he he curses a fig tree for having no fruit, even though it isn't its season to produce fruit. At first glance, this moment seems like it has nothing to do with the rest of the story. Why would Jesus get upset with a fig tree for not producing fruit when it isn't the right season? That should be a clue to readers that that his judgment on the fig tree is symbolic for something more significant. We must continue the story to see how it parallels the fig tree's fate. So Jesus condemns the tree, and then the disciples and Jesus move on and re-enter Jerusalem. Now it is finally time for Jesus to escalate things through a prophetic demonstration. The time has come, and he is the perfect audience for his dramatic political theater. The people's hopes and expectations are upon him. They believe that Jesus will be their liberator. They are hoping that Jesus will restore Israel and that the Jews will finally get freedom and independence. Rome has been a devastatingly powerful empire, and the Jews throughout the Galilean countryside have been experiencing excruciating poverty. In Scripture, God repeatedly judges oppressive empires. Whether it was Egypt, Babylon, or Assyria, divine judgment against harming the vulnerable was pretty consistent. God judges concentrated power that exploits the oppressed and crushes the power, the poor, With that in view, there is hope that God's Messiah will target the forces and seats of power that have a foot on the necks of the people. When Jesus finally enters the temple, he does not direct his righteous indignation directly towards Rome. Instead, it is the economic, political, and religious practices of the temple that Jesus has come to judge. God has always stood against oppression and exploitation, against imperial domination and concentrated power that crushes the poor, the widow, and the foreigner, and the Jerusalem establishment had become complicit in that very thing. The temple leadership and and high priestly families benefited from the temple tax, from their collaboration with Rome, from the sacrifices of the Jews who traveled from all over to worship God. The pillars of power resided in Jerusalem. Jesus does not need to confront an external Babylon when the ways of Babylon, which is concentrated power and, and, and exploitation, are occurring right in the temple by the hands of the Jerusalem power brokers. Jesus holds a mirror up to the rulers and authorities, to the temple bankers, to those profiting off of expensively priced animals, and those benefiting from the exploitation of the poor Jewish masses. Jesus engages in strategic, prophetic disruption of the temple. The evil practices are unveiled for what they are, and Jesus brings God's judgment. For the moment, all business as usual is halted through Jesus' prophetic disruption. The Jerusalem elites certainly would have thought that Jesus' behavior was irresponsible and uncivil. In general, when the status quo is working for one's favor, they are inclined to think that disrupting the central institutions of society is always inappropriate and disrespectful. The intensity with which Jesus damages property and intervenes to disrupt the commercial flow of money would have been described as outrageous and criminal by the authorities. This strategic prophetic disruption by Jesus had three targets. Jesus disrupted the temple overall, shutting down the flow of currency which turned the house of prayer into an exploitative marketplace. But even more targeted, his disruption overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Ancient Jews in that Greco-Roman society saw Roman money as dirty and ungodly, so the temple used Jewish Tyrian currency. The temple created a holier alternative for travelers seeking to offer sacrifice to God. First, understand that worshipers couldn't sacrifice an old or unhealthy animal because the sacrifice would be inspected to see if it was worthy to be to be given to god if the temple priests who had the final word decided that it was not worthy the worshipers would need to purchase a temple animal however if the money changes brought to pay for a sacrificial animal was uh however if the money brought to pay for a sacrificial animal was a roman coin it would need to be exchanged for tyrian coinage. 
After worshipers converted their currency into temple coins and made their purchase, they would finally have an animal to sacrifice. Between the temple exchange rate and the purchase of the sacrifice, they could easily be exploited twice. This reminds me of uh, trips to Chuck E. Cheese with my kids. I get to this place designed to entertain kids with food, games, and prizes, uh, but my money is not going to work there. I need to exchange it for Chuck E. Cheese currency. Of course, the amount of money you pay so you can get the exchange seems kind of ridiculous, but it's for the kids, so you just kind of go along with it. You give the kids the Chuck E. Cheese money and they run off and spend it all on games where they receive tickets in return. Yes, another currency. This double currency exchange just throws you off because it is hard to calculate its worth at this point. After After eating in an hour of play, the kids are tapped dry of coins, so you gather them together and head to the gift store in the corner where they can turn in their tickets for their prize. As you peruse the options on display, you realize quickly there is no perfect lamb to pick. To get the most bang for your buck, you convince the kiddos to limit their choice to to the best item they can get from the store in exchange for all of their tickets. And so after spending 50 bucks in coins, they each walk out of the store holding an eraser and a Tootsie Roll. They're smiling and happy, but you feel, you leave feeling like you've just been pickpocketed, right? It's a terrific little scam that they run with that giant mouse. Well, these temple worshipers might have felt something like that, but worse, after moving through the temple system while desiring to do nothing but offer sacrifice to God. Too often it was a well-oiled machine of concentrated exploitation that squeezed the last bits of money from poor people. Exploitation came through tithes, coin exchanges, and sacrifice on top of the overall debt these struggling people were entrapped by because of the merciless practices of these wealthy elite families in Jerusalem that denied them their jubilee. Do not miss it. The problem wasn't merely that they were buying and selling in church. It was that the flow of currency in the temple was going against its vocation and purpose. The temple was supposed to be a place of prayer and worship to God. uh, And it was supposed to form the people of God to be a people of justice. They were supposed to make provisions for the poor, care for the widows and orphans, care for the strangers in the land. Bringing shalom to all people was the vocation of the people of God. But now the economic flow of wealth was creating the haves and the have-nots. The Jerusalem power brokers were getting wealthy from the temple offerings, and even history and archaeological evidence indicate that many of these Jerusalem elite families lived in extravagant wealth while the masses of people were malnourished and in deep poverty. The temple, which was meant to be a house of worship for all nations, had become a hideout and a refuge for those that had used their concentrated power to exploit the poor. When Jesus said they had turned the temple into a den of robbers, he's invoking Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 7, centuries before Jesus, there was a prophetic judgment against the temple. The leaders thought that they could do no wrong because they were the temple leaders, and they thought they would reign forever. In contrast, the prophetic word to them is that God is coming and will judge them for their mistreatment of the poor and the most vulnerable in society. And so Jesus' strategic prophetic disruption is in fact the culmination and embodiment of that same prophetic judgment from Jeremiah. God and Jesus Christ has come to the temple and stands against all forms of oppression and exploitation. This judgment holds true regardless of whether it is aimed at an external empire or whether it's within the very life and institution of God's people. Jesus' prophetic disruption and divine intervention of the temple immediately placed people into a moment of dilemma. In a dilemma situation, people are forced to respond one way or the other. There's no distanced, apathetic ignoring of God's intervening through prophetic disruption. One must decide how one will respond. Obviously, repentance is the right choice, but but those in power rarely are willing to leave their old way of life sustained by the exploitation of others so they can follow Jesus. In that scenario, the dilemma for those who reject repentance becomes whether they will allow the disruptor to continue to demonstrate and denounce their complicity in the establishment, which of course means the person will continue to unveil the injustice for what it really is. 
Allowing such prophetic witness to go on erodes the foundation of the institution's power and respect. The other option is for those who wield the power to try to put an end to the thing causing them trouble. These temple leaders choose the latter and immediately begin looking for ways to crush his messianic movement by taking out its leader. There are always consequences for truly engaging in prophetic disruption of this old order. This is because the old order believes it will live forever, and it is mangled, its mangled ethics lead it to do anything at all costs to continue on. This is no surprise to Jesus, though. The empire always strikes back, right? There's always a, a backlash to eliminate the threat to power. Jesus understood this well before beginning his revolutionary action, and he expects that his followers would also count the costs and accept the consequences of clashing with the powers of society. Jesus and the disciples leave after a full day of disruption and a temple takeover of the teaching ministry. One day they slip out of the city, the next morning they pass it by the fig tree they saw the other day, but now it has withered away. Jesus explains to them that, it ha that if, they have had, if they have faith, even this mountain, referring to the temple mount, can be thrown into the sea um, if they believe. Uh, that statement and symbolism of the fig tree leaves us with a dangerous subversive pronouncement by Jesus. This fig tree was not producing fruit, and the temple and its representatives are not producing true fruit either. Uh, they have lost its vocation. They have veered off from its mission. And so here Jesus calls them a den of robbers and condemns the Jerusalem establishment in power, uh, not a condem condemnation of all Jews, but the establishment that's literally exploiting the Jews. Um, and so here we see God's consistency on this matter through, throughout Scripture. God extends divine judgment on the temple in this one moment and presses it outward toward all imperial institutional dens of robbers. Every practice of oppression and harm, every institutionalized coercion and exploitation, every hierarchy and form of indomination that exists are caught in the currents of this judgment. The old order won't last always because Jesus' reign and deliverance has begun. And so, radical discipleship, I want to suggest, is not a death wish. Um, it's, it's the way of Jesus is actually about living fully. But it isn't living so fully, but it's living so fully and so life-giving for others that it inevi inevitably clashes with death-dealing forces in our world. And taking up our cross means requiring us to accept the consequences that come from faithfully following Jesus and making his story visible in our very own lives for our neighbors. In moments of social and cultural polarization, what we need now is not centrism, right? That is to say, it's not going halvesies on very serious social concerns that we're faced with in our society today. Radical discipleship uh, as disciples means that we take up the risk of accepting all the benefits and consequences that come with participating in God's delivering presence in the world. Discipleship to Jesus, revealed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, doesn't provide easy answers to all our world's problems, but it does transform our values, our habits, our convictions, our relationships, and our experiences because they are being rewritten in congruence with the way of Jesus. And so my simple invitation is for us to radically follow Jesus through even the deep polarization of our current society, um, rather than avoiding the hard challenges of our day, to, uh, of our challenges of today. Um, let's radically follow Jesus through the strategic action of the Messiah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Drew, for uh, sharing with us, and I know that you all are on Kronos time here this morning, and you need to get to your uh, next classes, so uh, would you uh, just please stand? I'll say a quick blessing over us, and we will be able to go. Listen to this uh, blessing from Ephesians. It says, as we contemplate that call and that invitation uh, from Dr. Hart, listen to this. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Friends, thanks for coming to the Believer's Church Lectureship Series. Go in peace today.